I'm Steve Rowe, Executive Director. I have worked at Old Dome for almost 23 years. It will be uh, 23 years in April. Uh, so I started in, in 1999. Uh, I've been Executive Director now for the last five and a half years. Uh, and prior to that, I was Administrator and Chief Financial Officer. I accumulated a whole bunch of information while I was in that previous role that we kind of kept up. And I just find it very helpful to understand our community with the, the handout that I shared with you. And I'll reference that as we, as we go through this presentation. Um, I would really encourage you, like, I, I, I would like this to be interactive and more conversational than me just spitting information at you. Uh, so if you have a question about something that's up on the screen, please just stop me right there, ask the question, and let's just let's talk through everything. Um, this particular presentation is like we've adapted it every time I do it, but I've done it consistently now for about the past three and a half or four years. And the reason we started to do it is I realized fairly quickly into my time as executive director that even though our residents had paid $100,000 or $300,000 or sometimes even significantly more than that, a lot of people really didn't understand what they bought when they paid that hundred thousand or three hundred thousand um, dollars. I would get questions about what was what would the additional cost of moving to assisted living be, uh, and that kind of prompted us to make sure that at least periodically we're sharing this information with you, and we also talk about the process of transitioning to a higher level of care, whether that be assisted living or the health center. I've come to believe that people are only ready to learn about this and really understand it when they're ready to learn about it and really understand it. Uh, so we might talk about this now, but if you are somebody sitting in the audience who doesn't feel like assisted living is anywhere close in your future, you're not going to remember a lot of this when the time comes. If you're somebody sitting in the audience that is kind of wondering, it's like maybe in the next year, this might be something that, that is going to happen, uh, people pay much more attention. Uh, so what we've done is every six months, uh, and, and COVID kind of threw this out of whack a bit, but, but the intention is every six months, I do a version of this program and then on alternating quarters, our uh, social worker, Sarah Neary, and our assisted living coordinator, Jacqueline Craig, do a program that talks about the transition process. So at least on a quarterly basis, we're catching people that might be ready to start thinking about this a little more seriously. So, so I think you'll find it interesting, and again, ask questions along the way if you want to make sure that, that you're getting something out of this process. So. Um, so, we are a life plan community, and what that means is that we have independent living, assisted living, and nursing care all within the same system. We currently have 301 independent living apartments throughout our system. Most of those are at the main campus. 60 of them are here. 13 of them are at one university place and we have 10 duplexes or houses. Uh, so a lot of different options, anywhere from a very, very small one bedroom efficiency apartment up to a 2,600 square foot luxury apartment. So lots and lots of choices. We also currently have 37 assisted living apartments. There are actually 40 apartments on levels one and two. One of them is currently used as a not-in-resident contract. Two independent living people still live on level one, where assisted living is. So they chose to stay in their apartment when we started to convert those spaces on, on first floor to assisted living, just because they anticipated at some point they might need assisted living and they won't have to move to receive those services. So, so we actually have 40 apartments there, 37 are currently being used for assisted living. And then we have a 58 bed licensed nursing home or what we call our health center. That health center exists on three levels. So, and there are 
52 private rooms within those 58 licensed nursing home beds. So at the lowest level, and some of you have been in the short stay unit for some period of time, but we have 10 private rooms with a therapy suite immediately adjacent to those rooms for short stay. And the typical person who we're caring for in short stay, maybe it was a planned knee replacement, hip replacement, uh, maybe somebody had a stroke or a fall, and they need physical therapy, occupational therapy, in order to get strong enough to return home. And home might be independent living apartment, home might be an assisted living apartment, and home could also be just a general home in the Iowa City community. If we have space available in our short stay unit, we do provide that service to, to the general, uh, or the, to the broader community. Uh, recently, we haven't been able to do that very much because we've had a lot of need within our open home community. But that's first floor, the, the short stay unit. Up on level three of that same building is our memory care area called the loft. And that is 12 private rooms with a secure environment. So the people who we're caring for in the loft are those who we would be concerned about potentially wandering away. So, so we just want to have that extra safety of being in a secure environment. The residents uh, can leave uh, that, that space, but they need to be accompanied either by a loved one or by a staff member. Uh, it is a self-contained unit in that we do almost all of the meal preparation right there in front of the residence. There is a kitchen, there's a dining area, there's a living room space, there's lounge space, there's a walking trail, nice big murals on the walls that it feels like you're out at the cross country park at the university or just kind of out in, out in, in nature. Uh, so that's the loft memory care area. And then between short stay on first floor and the loft on third floor is long-term care. So we have you know, 30, I don't know, 30 rooms, uh, whatever, whatever is left over now, 36 licensed beds on, on second floor long-term care. The residents who live there are not going to get better and go home. They are going to be there essentially until they die. So they need 24-hour care, but they're, they're not a, a flight risk and they're not going to get better in their home. So, so it's long-term care, okay? So that's the, the life plan idea. Independent living, assisted living, nursing care, all within the same system. We have at the main campus a building that is anywhere from 56 years old, and this is where assisted living is currently, first and second floor, all the way to a building that is uh, six and a half years old. It will be seven years this summer. So lots and lots of additions over time. This is 1966, 1968, 1983 for this part of the building, 1990, uh, is the building where the loft and, and short stay are located. 1998, the second part of Benton Street. 2006, construction for the George building. I skipped one. 2004, construction for the Court building. And 2015, construction for the Spring building. So we're anywhere from six years old to 56 years old at the main campus. We also have, as I mentioned, 13 units at one university place. There are 77 condos in this north building. Oak Hill owns 13 of them. We have a mini Oak Hill community at one university place. And then, most recently, your homes. Uh, Oak Hill East with 60 apartments here. Uh, of the 60 apartments, we are currently at 58 contracts. Uh, we have one apartment on hold, one of the last two, uh, so we're really down to just one space that's truly available right now. So. This uh, presentation uh, is about the life care promise. It is our promise to care for each resident throughout your lifetime and 
is, and it is the assurance of care if and when it is needed in either assisted living or our health center, and the monthly cost stays the same. So independent living costs, whatever you're paying. If tomorrow somebody had a massive stroke, needed nursing home care for the rest of your life, your, your monthly fee would stay the same. That intermediate step of assisted living, the monthly cost stays the same. So independent living costs the same as assisted living costs the same as health center care. The only change, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned this, the only change is when you get to the health center, by regulation, we have to offer all of your meals and all of your snacks. So it becomes an all-inclusive meal plan, just like if you were away at a resort someplace. To do that, there is an extra cost, and the net increase to you would be $565, okay? And that's for all of your meals. So the local experience, and this is kind of the handout that I, that I gave you, as administrator and CFO, I, I, I'm a geek. I like numbers and I like to accumulate information. And I want, I was curious about like what was actually the history of, of residents? What happened to people as they lived at Oak Hall? So starting back in 2005, I began to accumulate this life story of an Oak Hall resident. And between July 1st of 2005 and just a couple of days ago, there have been a total of 389 residents who have completed their lives at Oak Hall. So, so in the past 17 years, we've had 389 residents die. Their average time at Oak Hall was just over nine years. And, and at, at, just as a point of reference, I, I occasionally will look at, okay, what was this like? Go some period of, of time ago, and in September of 2019, it was 8.8 .8 years. So what that tells us is over the last three years now, the people who have passed away have lived at Oak Hill longer than for the first 14 years of, of this data. Um, we actually have one woman like, who just died a couple of months ago. I don't know if any of you knew Ortha enough, uh, but she. She lived at Old Hall for 37 years. Um, she was almost 107 when she died, and she moved into Old Hall the year that I graduated from high school. <laughs> so, so you know, we, and so Ortha set the new record. Prior to Ortha, it was Dr. Ed Folk. Some of you might might remember Dr. Folk, and he had been at Old Hall for 36 years. Um, so, so average time at Oak Hall is 9.2 years. 32% of our residents, just about one third of our residents, never experienced that transition to assisted living or the health center. So if you think about this as a game, you paid a bunch of money to make sure that if something bad happens, you would have care. This group, didn't have that event happen. They died before it happened. So 32% so of our residents either had some massive event or they got very, very sick at end of life and might have spent a few weeks in our short stay unit before they died, but they never gave up their independent living apartment to move to assisted living or to move to the health center, okay? So 32% of our residents only lived in independent living. 29% of our residents, so, so almost a third now, experience all three levels of care. And if you look at the this handout, it's like there's two, the two sides of it are one side is looking at their total years at Oakdale, the back side of it is looking at the ages at which they either died or transitioned to a different level of care. I'm looking at the total years of that old home. Uh, and this group, that 29% that experienced all three levels of care, they on average lived at Oakdale for over 11 and a half years. 
So probably not surprising that this is the longest tenured group. Uh, they lived in independent living, then assisted living, then the health center, and experienced that extra support and care for the last years of their lives. And more than half of our residents eventually became permanent health center residents. So it's interesting to me when, when Rita and I do tours with prospective residents, you know, we'll, we'll talk through how it all works, we'll go and look at some nice pretty apartments, uh, and then you ask that household, would you like to see assisted living or would you like to see our health center? It's like, oh, no, <laughs> not good. Maybe one out of 10 households that we do that conversation with actually takes us up on that offer of seeing assisted living in the health center. So everybody wants that assurance that it's there, but nobody actually wants to see it. And nobody thinks it's actually gonna be me that needs that level of care. But our reality, 200 of those 389 people actually did live in the health center before they died. Okay. So do you have comparative statistics to other similar facilities? Um, I don't. Uh, I, so I, I can't tell you like how we compare. I can probably get that because for the last couple of years, we have done uh, actuarial analysis. We've hired a firm called Continuing Care Actuaries to look at our resident population and project what's going to happen, what is our need going to be in the future. They uh, have, we are one of about four or 500 clients that they have nationally. So I think we could find out, it's like how do we compare at least to their national database. But, no. but I don't have that off the top of my head. So alternatives to open up. If you didn't come here, it's like, what are, what are other options? Most places are a fee-for-service model. So we're an entrance fee model. People pay a good deal of money to come here for that assurance of care. Uh, an, an alternative, someplace like Melrose Meadows, you go to independent living and you pay X. If you need assisted living, they offer it and you pay X plus. If you need nursing home care, a place like Melrose Meadows doesn't have nursing home care, so you're looking for that and you pay X plus plus, okay? So, so it's, you know, that fee-for-service model, very easy to understand, uh, and we know based on our population, 54% of our people would have eventually been doing this, okay? Steve? Yes? Is there any place in the Sea Rapids, Iowa City area that Say, yes, uh, good question, Phil. Uh, so the, the uh, and I'll repeat the question for anybody at, at living uh, or listening in your living room or watching this later. Uh, so Phil's question is, is there any place like Open All that has a similar entrance fee model? And yes, the next closest place would be Cottage, Cottage Grove in Cedar Rapids. Uh, it's on uh, First Avenue in Cedar Rapids. They are a life care community as well. There are uh, six different life care communities in the state of Iowa. So another alternative, uh, aging place. So people modify their homes, they bring meals in, they bring home health services in, um, and that works for a good number of people. Um, I just last week had the experience of talking with somebody, uh, a, a gentleman who was really distraught uh, because his wife had Parkinson's, money was no object for this household. They had very healthy income, they could spend what they needed to for home health care. Um, they modified their house or actually built a new home after they learned of her Parkinson's diagnosis and intended to just bring in the care that, that she needed at the time that she needed it. And what has happened with them recently is he cannot find staff to provide that care in his home. 
So he can pay anybody, and really any amounts of money, but he cannot find that person to come in and spend the night in, in their home with his wife. Um, so, so that, you know, it sounds good, and for a lot of people it will work, but there are potentially some disadvantages there, so I, mean, I just heard of it firsthand last week. It's hard conversation. And, and our, the reality is, we are not an option for, for that household either because they waited too long. So it's like, oh, I can't really help them. And then I'm sure that many of you have heard about, oh, we're just, we're not going to go to a retirement community, we're not going to go to a city living, we're just going to go on a cruise ship. That's a really good idea until you need help going to the bathroom. And, and it's like, I don't think any cruise ship staff is going to be waiting in line to, to help you do that. <laughs> so, some options around the Iowa City area. Uh, just market rate prices, and this is a little bit outdated, but it's, it's fairly close. So legacy assisted living within just a couple of miles of here on, on Scott Boulevard. Um, the, the apartment piece of, of people's be living in assisted living, just for the real estate part of it, uh, starts at $3,900 for a, for a studio apartment and up to $5,400 per month for a two-bedroom apartment. And by the way, if you have a spouse or partner, uh, add another $1,000 to that. That is just for the apartment and the kind of utility functions of that. Then you get into the service component of being an assisted living resident. And, and Legacy is on a point system, so they look at what does this individual need and kind of assign points to different things and then price out their service based on how many points that person has accumulated. So just a, a, a relatively simple example, somebody who's a diabetic on four medications. I talked through this with our manager group this morning and asked our director of nursing, what is a typical number of medications that we're administering in the health center? She said 10 to 20 medications. So, so in this example, it's like, you know, it's four. So a relatively low number, but those four medications twice a day are worth 26 points. Doing a blood sugar check twice a day and an insulin injection is another 14 points. Assisting with bathing and dressing uh, is another 14 points. So that individual with relatively minor needs is already at 54 points and we're gonna add another $1,350 <coughs> to the cost of their service. So it's very easy to see that standalone assisted living is gonna cost in the neighborhood of six to $7,000 a month fairly easily, okay? Nursing home care. So Briarwood is just down the street from Oakland's main campus. Uh, these rates are current as of last summer and it's like they, they have three different daily rates depending on the space that you're in. If you're sharing a room, it's 238 a day. If you're in a private room, it's either 264 or 288. So we're looking at anywhere from seven to, to $8,500, $7,000 to $8,500 for nursing home care at Briarwood. For us at Old Home, we think we do things pretty well. We charge a little bit of a premium to the market and our current private pay rate for our health center is $335 a day. We currently have four individuals in the health center that we're providing care for that are paying us $10,050 a month for that care. So that is the market value of that care. And talk through a couple of scenarios here, like just to, to try to bring this to, to real life. So this first one is the very smallest apartment we offer. This is a main campus apartment in the 1968 edition. It's a one bedroom efficiency space. A lot of times we use those apartments as guest rooms, but there are some residents who this is their apartment. And, and so, so people do live in this size space. For Julie, uh, she's living here, it's like she paid an entrance fee of $99,000, and the monthly fee is $2,416. That's 
that includes a covered parking space for her. When she needs assisted living, I'm assuming that she's given up her car. Most of our assisted living residents no longer drive. Uh, so her cost has actually decreased when she goes to assisted living by that $40 a month for the covered parking spot. If she needs assisted living then, or at the health center, nursing home level of care, her cost has increased now to $2,834. So she's gone from $2,416 in independent living to $2,834 in health center care. She achieved that by paying a $99,000 entrance fee. So $2,800 compared to seven or nine or $10,000 a month is a pretty significant savings. Uh, to go from here to here, net increase of $418, and, and really what's driving that increase is the meal cost, okay? We're now providing all of her meals. Her actual living expenses probably didn't increase by $418 because some portion of her uh, of her monthly expenses would have been groceries or, or restaurants or things like that. So, but, but the overall bill increased by just over $400. Any questions on that scenario? Another scenario you didn't mention is one person is in independent living and the other person is in their health care. Yep, so yep, that that's, legacy. That's, what, yeah, that's what we're getting to. Oh, so, okay, sorry. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, so this next scenario and the last scenario that, that I'll share with you, this is a two-person household. Uh, the KK apartment is in the spring building. It's 1,306 square feet, so a little bit smaller than most of your apartments here at this campus but a very comfortable two-bedroom, two-bath apartment. The two-person entrance fee for that size apartment is currently $434,000. Monthly fee, $52.78. So this couple moves into independent living together, are managing okay, uh, but things start to change. So Joe's disease process made it unsafe for Jane to be his primary caregiver. We have a lot of two-person households that one person is very much supporting their, their spouse or partner. They're okay still in independent living, but if you remove the caregiver person from that situation, now all of a sudden we have two people who need, who need nursing care. Um, so, so if Joe needs additional support, they make the decision that he is going to transition to assisted living. So, so they move to, he moves to assisted living, she is still in their independent living apartment. So now they're occupying two different spaces. Their monthly cost has, has increased by 54, or by $137, it's down to 5415. I'm gonna forget these numbers, so somebody help me remember 5278. That's their baseline cost, 5278, okay? They're occupying two spaces now, independent living and assisted living. Their monthly fee has increased to $54.15, $137. The only increase is their paying property tax now on that second apartment. Their monthly fee didn't increase, their entrance, they don't pay any additional entrance fee, but they are gonna pay property tax for that second space. Jane has that catastrophic health she can't live in independent living. She also doesn't qualify for assisted living. She needs 24-hour nursing care in the health center. Now they're occupying two spaces again, but they're assisted living apartment and a, a room in the health center. Their monthly cost has gone, I think it was 5278, maybe, okay. It's now 5476. Um, they, they, they're occupying two spaces, uh, now 5476. Meal costs have increased pretty significantly, property tax has decreased pretty significantly. Situation evolves even further. Joe 
has been in assisted living. He now requires two people to get up out of the chair and to the toilet. Two people to get off of the toilet and into bed. Two person assist is a transition to the health center. As long as it's a one person assist, we can care for that person in assisted living. When they start to require two people consistently, they've exceeded care criteria for assisted living, and we have to talk about that, that transition to the health center. So now, it's like we've got two people in the health center, they're paying $5,964. So compared to where they were, $5,278, uh, when they started at Oak Home, they're paying now almost $700 a month more, but we are providing all of their meals for them, and they're both in the highest level of care. If they had not been open all residents and were in this situation, they'd be paying you know, $18,000 to $20,000 a month for nursing home level of care. Okay. So that's really the value of that life care promise in dollars and cents. Average months of stay for people in the health center is 2.6 years. So, and, um, it, it's just a very expensive place to be. You know. So, who decides? As we talk with people about, it's like, hey, this is what we're seeing. We think you would benefit from that transition to assisted living. Who decides? The resident absolutely is the primary decision maker here. I've got people who I'm working with right now who I have told them point blank, you would benefit from a transition to assisted living. That extra support would help your help improve your quality of life. Until that individual is ready to accept that, they're gonna be in their independent living apartment. Sometimes we don't get through to that person until there is that catastrophic event, and usually in that type of situation, it's gonna be a very bad fall with broken bones and things where, you know, all of a sudden there's no question that this person now needs nursing care. Uh, but, but the resident absolutely has to be part of the conversation. Family, to the extent that you want your family involved in the conversation, is also a piece of it. And then we as staff. So every Monday at noon, I am part of a transition team meeting with Kim, our administrator, with Sarah, our director of nursing, with the other Sarah, our social worker, with Jack, our nurse's living coordinator, uh, with Stacey Edwards, our apartment nurse, with department managers, and what we're talking about in that half hour meeting is what's going on throughout the community, who is on the verge of needing additional support and, and, and assistance. Looking at what do we know about planned surgeries so that when, we, when somebody is going in for that knee replacement surgery and needs our short stay unit, we, we know that we need to hold a space for them coming up in May because that's when they're gonna have their surgery. Uh, so, so it's looking at the entire community and planning and helping be prepared for what comes next. All three parties involved, and there, there was one transition that happened either, either right at the time that Pat was retiring or very early on in my time as executive director. I'm gonna blame Pat because I <laughs> think that it was her, but I don't remember for sure. Um, so we had a family that wanted to be protective of mom. Mom couldn't retain the information, but they excluded her from the conversation. So it's like the plan was, hey, on this day, we're gonna take mom off for lunch, we're gonna come back, and we're gonna take her to her new assisted living apartment. That was a flaming disaster. We are never going to do that again. We will always involve the resident, even if we have to talk with the resident 30 times in 30 days because they don't remember that we had this conversation yesterday. And honestly, she may not have remembered if we'd have that conversation that morning, but at least we as staff would have felt a whole lot better that we'd done everything we could to involve her in her life. So, so 
always the residents involved, sometimes the family is involved, but usually, and, and then we as staff to, to make that transition happen. So there's a lot of crazy ideas about how this happens. Um, have you heard this one? <laughs> so that is not at all true. So it's like there is nobody who's counting up the number of falls that somebody has had. And it's kind of a dangerous myth because maybe somebody's falling for a preventable reason. And they're afraid to even let us as staff know that, hey, this happened because there's a tick mark on their name now. And it's like, oh, that was number one and number two. It's like, that's not how it works. We want to support people. And sometimes people fall. And it's much better to be upright than it is to be horizontal. <laughs> but sometimes it happens, and we just want to provide support. Um, assisted living needs no privacy. Uh, the assisted living area is apartments. There are apartments with a front door, just like you have a front door to your independent living apartment. They have kitchens. They have bedrooms. They have living room space. Uh, so it's not no privacy. It's also not 24-hour supervision. One of the people I'm working with right now, I think the primary concern is that somebody's going to be watching that individual day and night. That's not what happens. It is 24-hour support, but it's not 24-hour supervision. And there is a huge difference. And our assistant living staff is absolutely fantastic at the gentle support. Uh, that is very, very helpful for people to live a good quality of life, but not intrusive support. So, so it's like they're, they're just good at it. Um, assisted living means that they have to eat in the whole dining room. You know, it's like we've never been that way as a community. Our residents, health center residents, assisted living residents, and independent living residents can eat in whatever venue you choose to eat in. So, so that's, that's not at all true, and that you can't attend the events or programs. Hopefully you've seen lots of people from assisted living or from the health center participate in the, the daily life of Oak Hall. This is probably the most challenging thing, and it was challenging as you move from your home to an independent living because it meant going from this much space to this much space or this much space. And the reality is for most of our residents, at the time that you would transition to assisted living, you're going from this much space to this much space. And this sometimes gets in the way. My stuff is more important than getting the care and support that I actually need. And that's really hard. It, it's, it's difficult to overcome. Uh, and I hope that when my time comes, I've learned my lessons and, and, said, and it will be easier for me. I, I don't know if that will be true, but that is really the biggest challenge that we have. And, and the reality is our assisted living apartments are 379 square feet to 758 square feet. That's what we have. So, so None, of, almost none of you here uh, have that size apartment. So the easiest transitions are when people move into a very small apartment on the main campus because their apartment sizes are changing, they're just moving locations. Where everybody else, it's letting go of things. I remember going to Legacy's open house when they when they opened up, and we had been. Uh, we had been providing assisted living services for about three or four years at that time. And I went into some of these apartments that were just very beautiful two bedroom and even three bedroom apartments. The reality is that size apartment for assisted living has nothing to do with the person who's living there and everything to do with the kids or the spouse or whoever so that they can feel better about having their loved one in that apartment. Because the reality is the person living in assisted living is not living in a two bedroom apartment. They are living in their bed, their favorite chair, and the bathroom. And all of the extra space is noise. 
it's not helping their quality of life because they're truly not living in it. So, so yeah, second. So the scenario is we have a couple, one person definitely needs assisted living, the other person might benefit from assisted living. That couple is, is sleeping in separate beds and, probably, and maybe even separate bedrooms. What happens? How do we accommodate that? So we try to reserve the larger apartments in assisted living, which are small two bedroom apartments uh, for people who are couples and for people who are moving from much larger apartments. So, so that is something that we're taking into account as we're, as we're working with that household. Um, it might be the situation where what we have available immediately at the time that, that you need it is not what you'll end up with eventually. Kind of that internal priority list, like so if somebody moves in, can tolerate it for some bit of time, but then we'll, we'll upgrade into the larger. Yes. Yeah. 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 We do have some two bedroom apartments there. Yes. Um, we as residents over here yep. face an additional challenge because if, if, if uh, my spouse, for example, were to go into assisted living, yep. I, I of course would be the last. <laughs> Home health care as a possibility. Yes. Would that be free of charge then? 
uh, in that situation, no. So, so, uh, so what we're what we're describing is a situation where somebody probably needs assisted living is choosing to stay at home rather than accept assisted living, and you absolutely are, have every right to do that and bring services in, but it is going to be an additional expense if you choose to do that. So. It might be cheaper for you to pay that service rather than have somebody going into assisted living. Maybe. <laughs> I think you should consider it. Okay. No, no. So the, the hard part there is that when we start to do that for you, we have to do it for everybody else, and we'll never have anybody move to assisted living. Other questions, sir? So, with the assisted living residents, at any time are they able to use trade service from third on third and go from? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, so, I'm uh, sorry, the question was for assisted living residents are they able to use trade service from third on third or from the old room? And yes, absolutely. Okay. I mean, you, you may get to this, but how do you handle hospice in the care center? Do they have trained people in the care center for hospice? Or do you bring in people for that? Or do you go, maybe go to the birdhouse from the care center? Yeah. Do people need hospice care? Yeah, so, so the question is about hospice care and it's like just really how does it work within the, the whole film context. So we are not a hospice provider, but we help and facilitate hospice care nearly every day. So you as an individual have the right to choose your hospice provider. A lot of residents would choose Iowa City Hospice. It's a local not-for-profit hospice provider that has been serving the Iowa City community for a long, long time. But there are other hospice providers like Compassus and Amenity, uh, and you as an individual have the right to tell us what hospice provider ought, do you want to use. Um, usually, end of life care we're providing in our short stay unit, and we would be partnering with that hospice provider. Hospice people will come in, and it's like typically um, the, the hospice nurse will be there for maybe an hour. There may be a, a aid that comes in at some point, but most of the care that that person is receiving is still coming from Old Mill staff. So hospice uh, gives us the ability to provide some additional comfort measures, uh, and, and for most people it's a really positive experience, uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's that partnership with whoever you choose to use. Okay, someone choose to go to the bird house, or? Yep. You certainly could do that. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. I don't know what's next, so I'm going to just let the pre a second. Yes? Um, in your five-year plan, there, you wrote about um, replacing uh, the assisted living yes. facility. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I'm going to come back. So. We're actually nearly at the end of the slide, so I'll, I'll answer your question as, as part of this. So this is a typical assisted living apartment. It's 484 square feet. It's a one bedroom space. As you walk in, there's a small kitchenette, there's a living room space, there's a bedroom space, and a bathroom space. Um, it works really well. That size is actually a really good size for providing assisted living services. But many of you, I know, are cringing at the thought of it's like, how, how do I go from a 1,300 square foot apartment to a 484 square foot apartment when, when I need a facility? But that is the most typical size. Um, I'm going to flip all the way back here. Sorry. Almost there. To. Where we provide assisted living currently is a two-story building built in 1966, or opened in 1966. Uh, it has seven-foot hallways. I'm 6'1". I feel like a giant walking through the hallway on the 
first floor of assisted living. When you get in the apartments, it's eight foot ceilings, which like are, are more, feel a little more normal. Uh, you all have nine foot ceilings here. <laughs> so, so just walking down the hallway of assisted living, it's like, it just feels a little bit tight. Um, it is a 56 year old building that has 56 year old plumbing. Last week, we averted disaster through kind of creativity from mechanical services. There's an apartment that like was not, the sink wasn't drained properly. They fish a camera down through the, the drain pipe and eventually got some mud. That's not a good thing when they're in, in a drain pipe. Um, so the main sewer pipe in, in that part of the building for about 12 feet is completely corroded. Like, and that sewer pipe runs down the middle of the hallway and it's buried about three and a half feet deep in concrete. Like, hmm, this is not good. And it would cause quite a mess and quite a smell uh, if we were digging that out to repair that. So like they were creative and figured out a solution that uh, in the wall we can drain it and get it to a part of the pipe that's fine. Uh, so that will buy us a little bit more time. Does it buy us another six months or another six years? I don't know. Uh, but that is why we absolutely are focused on what is the replacement of assisted living because we've got this 56 year old building that in a lot of ways just feels like a ticking time bomb. That it's like it's not serving us well. If we could design our ideal assisted living apartments now, you know, I said that that works. It works because we make it work, but probably a more ideal size would be 600 square feet with lots of natural light. And, and, you know, and if we were building something from scratch right now, that's what we would build. So what we're trying to figure out is how do we take this 56 year old building and make, either make it feel like brand new construction and, and modern, or how do we build a brand new building while we are simultaneously serving 37 assisted living resident households. Because uh, we don't have the luxury of just sending everybody away for two years while we, while we build the replacement. But that's, that's what we're trying to, to wrestle with right now. And it's like we've started the process. We're working with the architectural firm, asking them to just look at any possibility either on land that we already own or contiguous property around us that we don't own, but maybe we need to try to acquire so that we can build something, move people into that, and then do something with, with the land that we're vacating. So that it absolutely is the, sorry, I'll come back, uh, absolutely is probably the highest priority within our current uh, three-year strategic plan. Molly, did you have something that we just showed you? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying, I'm thinking about a situation that probably many of us here might be faced with, which is something short of assisted living, but still with real uh, medical needs and life care needs that need to be attended to. And it sounds like from what you're describing, really the only options are at home or short stay. And, and short stay really is an option for, for that type of longer term situation. Short stay is by definition a short stay. We're trying to help people get better and go home, or we're help, trying to help people with, die with as much comfort and dignity and respect as possible. But it's, like, it's not a situation where people are gonna be there for months on end. But are there, I mean, how do you define the constraints or the limitations on short stay? That's what part of what I'm trying to do. Yep. So is your prognosis one that we expect you to get better and we're going to keep working with you through therapy to help you get better and go home? Or are, so that's one, one set of people that are one, yeah, one set of residents that we're caring for. The, the other group of residents that we would be caring for in short stay would be, would be people who are terminally ill. And, and we know they're going to die, it's just a matter of when. Mm -hmm. and, and we're tr trying to make that as comfortable and, and peaceful as possible for them and their, and their family. 
Um, there is kind of a third group of residents uh, that we think when you first come into short stay that you're going to get better and go home. And at some point along the way you plateau and you're not able to, to go back to home, whether it was assisted living or, or independent living. And that's where people become the permanent long-term care residents on second floor of the health center. So you said that 32% of residents stay in independent living until they die. So of those 32%, do you know what percentage have their own long-term care insurance policy? I don't. Uh, yeah, it, it's something that theoretically we have the data, but it's not one of the things that we've, that we've looked at. I will say, um, I would guess at least half of the new residents in the past five years come to us with long-term care insurance policies. And, and that insurance policy very well might pay for home care services. So that would be something to, to think about and explore uh, with, if, if you have that type of, of insurance coverage. Yes. Do you have these slides on the open app? Uh, they are not, but they can be. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I just had lunch with a friend today and she needs, I know she can get a packet, but oh, I sure. should some of the slides yeah. to be yeah, very absolutely. helpful. Yeah, um, I don't know how to do it, but somebody smarter than you <laughs> will, will help me figure out how to put this out on, onto the app. So. Any last questions? We're almost at 8 o'clock. Thank you. I hope this has been helpful Thanks. to you. All right. And we'll do it again in six months. <laughs> <laughs>